So my name is Jamil Jaffer, and I'm the founder and executive director of the National Security Institute here at George Mason University Anderson Scalia Law School. I'm thrilled to be today to be hosting the first in a series of sessions that we're going to be doing on the national security implications of antitrust. Today is an introduction to that series, and I'm very excited to have uh, some, some amazing former colleagues, some great friends uh, with us today. I'll just go for, sort of from left to right. Uh, first with us is Josh Wright. Josh is the is the executive director of the Global Antitrust Institute here at George Mason University's Anderson Scalia Law School. He also holds a courtesy appointment at the, at the Department of Economics. He, as of 2013, was a, was the, was a member of the Federal Trade Commission uh, following his nomination by President Obama. He rejoined uh, the Scalia Law School as a full-time member of the faculty in 2015. He's a leading scholar in antitrust, law, economics, intellectual property, and consumer protection. He's published more than 100 articles and book chapters in this space and has co-authored a leading uh, antitrust casebook um, and edited several book volumes. So Josh, really great to have you here with us. Uh, we're also joined uh, by Ashley Baker. Ashley is the Director of Public Policy at the Committee for Justice. Her focus areas include Supreme Court, regulatory policy, antitrust, and judicial nominations. She's written extensively um, in Fox News, USA Today, the Boston Globe, The Hill, Real Clear Politics, and the like. She's a founder of the Alliance on, on Antitrust Coalition. She testified before the Senate on the topic of antitrust law and the like. So we're thrilled to have two amazing antitrust experts with us here in Josh and Ashley. Mike Davis, good friend and former colleague uh, with Justice Neil Gorsuch, is the founder and president of the Internet Accountability Project, an advocacy organization fighting to rein in big tech. He's a former chief counsel for nominations to, to Senate Judiciary Chairman Chuck Grassley. He also leads the Article Three Project, which defends constitutionalist judges and the rule of law, along with the unsilenced majority, an organization dedicated to can opposing counsel culture and fighting, get, fighting back against uh, the woke mob, as, as Mike puts it, and its enablers. Davis served in all three advances of the government, um, including for President George Bush, Justice Department, for House Speaker Newt Gingrich, um, and current Supreme Court Justice uh, Neil Gorsuch, where I was a co-clerk of his. And last, but certainly not least, Glenn Gerstle. Glenn is the former general counsel of the U.S. National Security Agency um, and the Central Security Service. He served there for five years, from 2015 and 2020. He's written, spoke, written and spoken widely about the intersection between national security law and, inter, and, and, uh, and, um, and technology. Prior to joining NSA, uh, Mr. Gersel practiced law for 40 years at the international law firm on Bill Bank, LLP, focused on the global telecommunications industry, and was a managing partner of the DC office. So Glenn brings a wealth of knowledge about both uh, corporate law and national security law uh, to bear on this problem. So look, we've got a great panel here today. We're going to talk about all the pieces of this. Uh, we've got Josh and, and and Ashley talk about the antitrust folks, Glenn to talk about the national security component here, and Mike talks about the politics of this and how all that comes together as these issues get debated in our political environment and, um, and on Capitol Hill. So with that, Josh, talk to us about uh, what's going on in this space. We know that there's been a lot of talk about this, this sort of tech lash against big tech. Mike runs an organization focused on going after big tech in this space, but there's this antitrust component to it. There's a lot of talk about how uh, we need antitrust law to either be modified or reformed. You served on, uh, on the Federal Trade Commission, uh, the organization that does a lot of this work. Uh, you've co-authored a treatise in this space. Tell us about what we should be thinking about. What, should we, what, do, we plan, what do we expect to see um, in the antitrust space when it comes to these technology com companies? Thanks, Jamil. And it's a pleasure to be on with, with, with uh, this panel. So I appreciate you, you having me. Um, Look, what, what's not going on in this space? I mean, essentially all I do is, is, is antitrust and economic regulation. So I've been in this space for a really long time. I've worked at the Federal Trade Commission four, four different times, uh, the last time as a commissioner. So sort of everything from getting coffee for people to, uh, uh, to voting on cases. This is the you most- You were an intern there. You showed as an intern there, Josh? I did, I did. Amazing, amazing. Uh, so, uh, you know, it is by far, I think, the most interesting time in antitrust in my lifetime. And that's for a lot of reasons, and certainly some, um, you know, sort of caused by the political salience of the sort of big tech uh, de debate and fight on, on, on both sides and some of the appeal that it's had politically on both sides. And I'll, I'll leave um, that, that for Mike to, to sort of tee up for, for our discussion. But um, there are a lot of battlefronts right now, sort of one being legislative, but the other being inside the agencies and still a third in the courtroom, right? Yeah. Um, and so if you just look at what's going on in sort of live active litigation right now under existing law, um, 
private plaintiffs are suing, state AGs are suing, the feds are suing, the FTC's right. got a Facebook case, the DOJ's got a Google case sort of hold, held over from the Trump administration, uh, the state AGs. There are 53 state AGs that are active in big tech cases. Don't ask me how you can have more than 50. Some have some have multiple units uh, in, involved. Um, and so you've got state cases against Facebook, Google. You've got private cases against uh, Apple. Uh, investigations running with Amazon and sort of everybody. So you've got uh, everybody suing everybody in these cases uh, at various stages, a sort of trial date set. Um, and I know it doesn't always match the sort of uh, political big tech theme, but uh, you know, the FTC just got done suing and losing uh, to Qualcomm, which I think when it yeah. comes to the intersection of the area that we're going to talk about today uh, and, and sort of externalities imposed by antitrust enforcement decisions as it, when it comes to national security in China certainly is a, uh, a big part of the discussion as well. And so uh, you've got lots of live cases going on to see how we're going to do under existing law. You know, government has a really good win rate in its cases, it wins 85% of its merger cases. Uh, they win some and lose some, but 85% is a, a prosecutorial rate. Unless you're doing, you know, drug busts, you're pretty, you're pretty happy with. Um, yeah. it, you know, the government wins a lot of these cases. I suspect it will win some of these. It will lose some of these. Uh, but one of the interesting things that we've got, and I'll, I'll sort of uh, stop there and let, let other panelists chime in, is you've got this parallel track, uh, simultaneous legislative debate. Uh, yeah. While the game's being played with the live cases about uh, whether existing law is enough or not enough. And I think lots of important questions there uh, to talk about as well, while you've got new leadership at the agency sort of deciding what they think they can get done under existing law. Uh, Lena Khan's FTC, uh, free release for right. antitrust people has said, um, let's do something brand new. We used to bring cases and do consents. We're going to throw rulemaking in the mix. And for, you know, a lot of antitrust lawyers dusted off their admin law books because they haven't looked at them in a really long time or they never right. did. Um, but you've got a big, aggressive EO from the Biden administration that yeah. includes stuff that touches both platforms, but also intellectual property rights holders um, in, in the tech space uh, in an FTC that I think is looking to do um, lots of things in antitrust, sort of uh, uh, also some... Uh, Sort of bringing some social justice causes in inside of, of, of antitrust, which has drawn a lot of, of criticism. So yeah. uh, a lot to chew on. Let me let me stop there and uh, let let you move to the other panelists. Well, that's I mean that's a great way. That's actually a great pivot to Mike. Uh, you know, Mike. So you know, one of the things going on here. Josh talked a lot about the sort of the setup here. Um, you know, there is this tech clash taking place, right? A backlash against big tech companies. Uh, you're uh, at the leading edge of some of that uh, some of that uh, effort. Um, Help us understand, like what what is what is this what is this about? What is this tech lash about? Um, uh, you know, what are the politics of it? Um, obviously, you know, Josh points out that, that the rules of the game are changing in a variety of ways. One, there's this effort on Capitol Hill uh, to change the laws it stands when it comes to antitrust. Um, we see an effort going on in the agencies. You know, Lena Khan, uh, uh, you know, uh, confirmed on a bipartisan vote. A lot of uh, I think a lot of people are surprised to see how many Republicans supported her uh, her nomination uh, to the commission and then ultimately her becoming the chair. Um, and and a, and a big regulatory effort um, coming out of the Biden administration, as Josh points out, with this executive order, you know, really coming after technology companies and, and other companies. Um, normally, you wouldn't see conservatives, you know, and I think that's how you describe yourself um, out there on this front. Talk to us about what the what the tech lash is about. Oh, you're muted, Mike. You're muted. Oh, am I unmuted now? There You're we go. Good. I apologize. Um, I think what we're seeing is that big tech, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, and to a lesser extent, Twitter, has managed to bring together the Elizabeth Warren, Lena Khan wing of the Democrat Party with the Donald Trump wing of the Republican Party. It's the Mike amazing, Davis wing of the Republican Party. Sorry, the, the Mike Davis wing. Uh, so it's it is, uh, it's pretty amazing what big tech has been able to do in a very short amount of time. And the reason they've been able to do this is A, they have too much power, uh, which the, the, the Elizabeth Warren, Lena Khan wing doesn't like. Uh, and B, they're using that power that is censoring, silencing, uh, deplatforming conservatives like Donald Trump, a sitting president of the United States. So conservatives, don't like that. So if you step not, back, not still sitting, not still sitting. 
he was sitting yes that's right, right. that's right not yet jamil although jamil. some well some have said right exactly sorry <laughs> mike go back to you back to you so, so anyway the um and so the politics of this is this that we have these century old anti antitrust laws the sherman act the clayton act they've been on the books for a century right and the uh, the antitrust laws are law enforcement. They're not regulation. They're the opposite of regula regulation. You are targeting the bad actors. You're targeting the monopolists. So you don't need uh, industry-wide regulation. And you have these uh, trillion-dollar monopolists, Facebook, and mostly Google is the biggest one. But Google, uh, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, and I call them their bar-fighting little brother Twitter, uh, which uh, they, they, Twitter doesn't help their political political cause by any means. They're they're largely insignificant in the in, in the market, but they are uh, the they are the ones that manage to get conservatives the most worked up. Um, mm -hmm. And you you have these trillion dollar monopolists, and they are uh, they are they are censoring conservatives. And so the uh, you know the I, I think conservatives say you know what I don't know what I think about uh, you know generally I don't like the government involved with private business. Right. Generally, I don't like regulation. Right. I generally we big is not that right and uh you know that's generally the conservative argument but i think a lot right. of conservatives at the end of the day say you know what if these big tech companies are going to come after us if they're going to censor a sitting president of the united states if they're going to collude to kill parlor if they're going to do a lot of these bad things that conservatives don't like then screw them right let's let's enforce our antitrust and antitrust laws now whether that's legally correct not legally correct that's the political reality right now is right this. big tech has managed to anger conservatives and so there is this from big tech's perspective there's this unholy alliance between the elizabeth warren wing of the democrat party and right. the, um and the donald trump wing of the republican party and frankly from my perspective i think they brought it on themselves if if they had not censored conservatives if they had not done their woke nonsense if they had not deplatformed conservatives if they had not deplatformed president trump if they had not colluded to kill uh parlor you had the the app store duopoly of google uh and apple kicking parlor out of the app store and then amazon mm -hmm. kicking parlor off the internet if they had not colluded to censor the new york post one of the oldest newspapers in the country to help Joe Biden get elected by uh, by suppressing stories about Hunter Biden and his laptop, if they had not done these things. We would not be talking about antitrust right now. We have big tech has enjoyed antitrust amnesty for the last decade. They would have continued that antitrust amnesty probably forever, but they managed to get the right and left angry enough to work together to start enforcing our antitrust laws. Interesting. Interesting. So, Glenn, you know, one of the one of the reasons we brought this group together and one of the reasons you're you're here part of this group, we've got the national experts with Mike Salas about the politics of it, is you know, there are national security implications of 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 how we treat our companies in the United States, how we deal with the this new marketplace, this globalized marketplace. Uh, we all Americans have really finally woken up to the threat that China poses to us at a strategic level um, in the aftermath of, of COVID-19 or, or the beginnings of the aftermath of COVID-19. Um, and they've, they've learned about the threat that our supply chain faces from um, some of these things. They've long heard about the cyber activities and, and the, the theft of trillions of dollars out of the US economy by China um, at a nation state level. But Glenn, talk to us about, I mean, so how does this all come to you? Why does, why does it matter what we do on antitrust to global competitiveness? And why, what does that matter to our national security? I mean, is there a time between national security and antitrust or are we all just sort of, you know, is, is this just a chimeric thing? Thanks, Jamil. And first, uh, let me just say thanks for including me on this uh, panel with such uh, distinguished other experts. So it's uh, I'm delighted to, to address what is a very important point. And, and you said it exactly, Jamil. Um, uh, the, the tech industry is different. Um, uh, Josh and Mike alluded to the fact that uh, antitrust doctrines developed over a century ago aimed at Standard Oil, which at the time controlled almost 90% of the petroleum in the United States and railroads with very strong predatory practices. So that, that doctrine uh, does not translate easily, I would suggest, into the tech center, to the tech sector. Uh, and I'm, I'm speaking more broadly than just social media here. Um, and that has national security implications, which, which we need to examine. So 
um, the effect of the technology, the technology sector, uh, is, as opposed to old fashioned bricks and mortar industry on the end user and consumer and the overall effect on our economy is different for a number of reasons. A lot of them are obvious. Let me just spend a minute or two touching on the more obvious ones so we can see why uh, this, uh, we need a different lens through which to look at uh, antitrust issues. And just to be clear, I'm not suggesting, I don't think anyone is suggesting that big tech be exempt from, from antitrust. That, that's not the issue on the table. Right. Um, but but uh, as a result of the digital revolution, uh, technology is far more pervasive and far more profound in our everyday life, in part because of its functionality, its very interconnected nature. So right. it, it touches all of us in a very different way than any one industry that might have been an antitrust focus before. It affects our national well-being. Um, even in its heyday, you could not have said that General Motors, then the largest company in the United States, uh, where if a mishap occurred there, would have affected our national well-being. Today, you could pick any one of 20 companies, whether it's Visa and MasterCard, misinformation on social media platforms, a disruption in the two big cloud providers, uh, cloud service providers that would have extraordinary ramifications throughout all aspects of society. Um, so technology, broadly speaking, including the social media platforms and the very big tech companies, directly affect our national well-being, which is to say our national security. It's right. come upon us with unprecedented speed. So we're still grappling with how to regulate it. I mean, the iPhone is only from 2007. Facebook only became a factor in our lives, what, a decade ago or so? Right. So we're still figuring out how to regulate it. And there, it, generally, let alone in antitrust reasons. So I think that's another reason we should tread uh, carefully. Uh, you mentioned the pandemic. The pandemic accelerated and revealed some some key features about technology, and we saw how its defining feature, the technology sector, was to evolve very rapidly and to innovate. Look at, look at how things change with work from home, yeah. sh shopping patterns, et cetera, all because the tech sector responded in an extraordinarily short period of time in a way, again, that profoundly affected our national well-being, both helped right. it and in some ways hurt it. Um, the, that, the tech sector clearly drives R&D in the United States, and that has a huge national security implication um, uh, for us as we think about the, a rising China. Obviously, the, the land trust experts can talk about the fundamentally different business models, since most of the stuff on the internet is free. It's not a question of price competition. And then mm -hmm. finally, the point you mentioned, which I know we're going to spend more time on, Jamil, is that the tech sector by definition is global. This is a global marketplace due to the interconnectivity, the economies of scale, the inherent nature of the global internet. So dealing uh, on an antitrust basis with a domestic company and not treating it uh, internationally, because if we, if we adopt some regulations here, I'm not saying that we shouldn't, but if, if we do anything here, it'll have an effect on these global companies, their ability to, pe to, to compete in China. And at right. the same time, China is not going to be imposing those regulations and similar cutbacks on their company. So we need to right. look at this very carefully and very yeah. holistically. No, it's a, it's a great point, Glenn. So, so Ashley, uh, bring us back around here. So, you know, we started with Josh talking about sort of the core antitrust, uh, you know, issues that are at stake here and the idea that, that the law is changing both because the FTC is taking a more regulatory approach um, uh, with, with Capitol Hill and, and the things that, and, and, and dynamics that Mike talked to us about um, and the reality of, you know, China competition, the reality that we have a, near peer and soon to be peer competitor in China, both militarily and, and economically. Um, how, do we, how do we think about the way that antitrust law can or should evolve in this space and, and its application to a highly innovative and rapidly evolving sector like technology? What are you thinking, Ashley? Well, I'd like to take a kind of a step back and um, just first mention that this isn't just about technology. And I, I don't view it in just a tech lens because when you change the law, you're changing it often for all sectors. Right. Um, and we've also have to look historically too, because um, there are some good examples that don't involve technology that have involved, you know, American competitiveness during um, times of war. Like for example, there's um, the, there's this myth that the left and that the Biden administration keeps perpetuating that like Thurman Arnold's DOJ helped us get through World War II and then like you know revive the economy and that could be further the 
from the truth, actually. Um, the mm -hmm. GP antitrust division was inflated by about 25 times. And then, you know, when they realized that we needed, you know, to manufacture steel and do other things, you know, to invent airplanes and, um, you know, fuel the engine of democracy, um, that is when there was conveniently a vacancy on the DC circuit and FDR um, very quickly put him there and shrunk the entire department. So, you know, these industries have always supported us during those times. And I think that's something to remember, um, you know, whether or not we like them or not, um, we do have them kind of at our disposal. I think in, in terms of today's current debate around technology, though, I mean, if you look at the House antitrust bills, for example, or you know, any of the hearings in the Senate, anything else, there has never been a substantive discussion um, about antitrust and national security. I think it's brought up maybe for two or three minutes during mm. the House workup over these six or seven bills, but it was all just political hand waving. You know, someone brought yeah. up a point or two about national security and then they moved on to, oh no, Section 230 or some other unrelated issue that really has no role in this debate whatsoever. Um, another thing I think is worth mentioning is that every time, you know, one of these radical proposals, such as like flipping the burden of proof for the EO in general about competition, it really wasn't about competition. It was using competition to justify a lot of other things. Every single time that happens, there's a reaction abroad that is... Um, not proportional, but a lot worse. Like for example, with the executive order that was hmm. released and signed on a Friday afternoon by the next Monday morning, China had right. announced their tech crack crackdown um, in antitrust. Um, you know, Jack Ma's company being um, part part of that. A lot of other companies, um, any company that does not benefit the CCP. You know, there there are yeah. people actually arguing that China's crackdown on these companies um, and their crackdown on tech is how like the the newspapers are framing it is actually harming the CCP. It couldn't be further from the truth. Um, they're doing that selectively. And if you look, there's a great parallel right. um, in intellectual property as well and how they have selectively enforced IP over the years. So I think that there is yeah. a lot that we're um, not looking at in this debate. And speaking of IP, I think also a lot of this hamstrings us when it comes to the um, global competition over 5G, particularly the yeah. executive order and standard essential patents. So, so, uh, so Ashley, let's talk about that for a second. So you make this point that, you know, on a Friday, the, the Biden administration um, issues its executive order on antitrust. By Monday, you see China cracking down. Glenn made the point earlier um, that, you know, maybe if we enforce antitrust laws, if China doesn't do it right, they're going to, they'll, they'll get some, they'll get some gains. But to your point, they are enforcing it, but in a way that actually is political there too, right? In order to sort of suppress dissent uh, amongst companies that may be leaning more forward and getting out of line. Um, but it feels to me like that ties back around here because Mike made the point earlier, right? That it wasn't, at least on the conservative side, it's not really about antitrust or about the law itself. It's really about politics and deplatforming the like. So how do these things come together? Is, is that what's happening here? Is this really the use of antitrust laws, even in China and in the US to go after companies because they're political issues, not real business related issues? So I should make a clarification. Um, when I say there, there's a reaction in China and the EU, that's I'm not I'm not um, referring to you know specific enforcement actions that are you know legitimate cases of enforcement or you know even certain lawsuits. I'm referring to these big broad proposals that would mm -hmm. um, that are very opportunistic to these countries, um, such right. as the executive order that gives them a really good opportunity to achieve some political goals. Yeah. I mean, so John, yeah. Can ahead, I just please. jump in very quickly on yeah, that please. point? Because um, I think you raise a, a, a very a, a very key issue that we need to be very clear-eyed about. Uh, there's a lot of talk about how China is adopting new privacy regulations, cracking down on big tech, and yeah. et cetera. And I think it's a mistake for us to think that, oh, China has suddenly become this benevolent uh, uh, government that is very concerned about the welfare of its citizens and wants to make sure they have the very best. Uh, right. I'm sure that's that's a piece of it. Yes, of course, they're a government. They need to be responsive to their citizens, too. But this is fundamentally about a situation in which China encouraged the rapid development of technological industries for yeah. its own strategic purposes. And then once they became very big and very significant and, and powerful there, too, um, the Chinese Communist Party recognized that they need to shift this strategically and put more control on it for the purposes of having government control. And that's why you see, for example, something you couldn't even imagine here, which is the Chinese government has a seat 
on a on a ByteDance subsidiary, and they own part right. of ByteDance, one of the key, a, a TikTok sister subsidiary. You couldn't possibly imagine the United States government doing anything remotely the same, nor would we want to in the United States. So this is much more about China controlling technology for their own strategic goals. Well, so let me ask you, Mike, because, yeah, Ashley, did you have something to say? Oh, I, I was just going to add to that, that, you know, some of these proposals in the U.S., you know, what Glenn said is particularly dangerous because it would require uh, the United States to treat companies like Bike Dance and Huawei and TikTok on the same level and prioritize them on the same level as U.S. companies and yeah. their vehicles of the Chinese state. Yeah. So, Josh, I'm going to I'm going to come back to you and talk to you about the bigger implications for antitrust law about about these issues. But but I want to I want to ask Mike a question. So, Mike, you know, one of the points you made earlier that we just were talking with Glenn and Ashley about was that, you know, look, for conservatives here in the United States, it really is politics is motivating. Normally they would be, they're not opposed to sort of bigness or size and, you know, success is good for uh, for conservatives when it comes to private industry. Um, they don't want government tangling it. But in this case, because they're being suppressed uh, or they, they perceive themselves being suppressed on on Twitter, on on these other platforms and the like, as you point out, all to get together to de-platform and the, fo and, and the like, is that the right use of antitrust law? I mean, or is, is that what's happening? That we're, we're, we've got a political beef and we're now using antitrust laws to enforce this political beef. And if it is an appropriate way to do it, um, do we, are we concerned that it's gonna have large implications for the way we treat uh, anybody in the antitrust space and, and for our global competition? So let's back up and make, let me make a couple points here. Yeah. Uh, the first point is, is let's, uh, let's, let's deal with this notion that Google and Apple and these other big tech companies are these, proud pro-America companies and we need to coddle them, we need to protect them with, uh, with continued antitrust amnesty. Let's, let's look at 2018. Um, back in 2018, we had uh, two things that Google was looking to do at the same time. Um, one was Project Maven. Uh, Project Maven was uh, the Google's contract with the military for our drone program. And you had these activist employees at Google, I think there were a thousand of them who sent a letter to Google's executives saying, we should not be involved with the American drone program. And so yeah. what did Google do? They, they did not renew the contract, right? They, they, they backed out of the government's Maven contract on our, uh, on our drone program. Um, you can debate you know, whether that's right or wrong as a moral matter, as a policy matter, uh, but from the United States' perspective, they thought it was a national security priority to have this drone program and you have these activist employees at Google who got Google to back out of this. At the same time, as The Intercept reported, what was Google doing in 2018? Uh, they were working with the Chinese government, the CCP, the communist Chinese government on a project called Dragonfly. So Maven, pro-America Maven program was bad. Yeah. We had to back out of it, but Google was in negotiations with the communist Chinese government for Dragonfly, which was a search uh, a search engine that the Chinese government was going to have where they can censor people. So yeah. let's just get that on the table right away. That this idea that we need to coddle Google, we need to coddle Apple, or excuse me, we have to coddle Facebook. Let's talk about what Facebook's right, doing right now. We have um, what's going on in Afghanistan. We had a country uh, that we spent 20 years with uh, trillions of dollars, 20 years, trillions of dollars, a lot of American lives to help support the Af Afghan military, right? And yep. very rapidly, the Taliban was able to get uh, to Kabul, include, including to the airport. Uh, and there are many right. reasons for this. There are many reasons that the Taliban was able to do this, right? One reason is that they were using an app uh, developed by, or that, that's owned by Facebook called WhatsApp, right? They were able to communicate everyone just about everyone in Afghanistan has WhatsApp, right? And they were able to communicate very rapidly and take over Kabul, including the airport where we have American stranded right now. There were just bombings there this morning um, and they were able to communicate. They were able to use WhatsApp as a very effective tool to very rapidly take over Afghanistan and have the, and they did this without, uh, largely without firing a bullet, right? So yeah. let, let's talk about this notion that Google, that Apple, that Facebook, that these companies are pro-American companies, that these Americana companies that we need to prop up. That's just nonsense. Well, so, so Josh, you know, Mike raises an important point here, which is that this idea that, that these companies have enjoyed antitrust immunity, uh, right, for years. Um, um, and haven't and haven't been uh, subject to antitrust enforcement actions, and now they are. And and according to Mike, I think his view is that they're being held finally being held accountable. 
Um, and and he, he points out that there might be national security implications here, right? If if you know if if a company is 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 pushing back on on the NSA and the U.S. military and DOD on one hand, and then and then doing stuff for the Chinese state on the other, right? Or enabling uh, communications of, of of terror groups or people that we've been opposed to while suppressing political voice in the United States. These are all seem like big problems. But I guess what I'm interested in is an amateur scholar and somebody who served on the Federal Trade Commission. That all seems like a big problem, right? Potentially, and maybe something that Congress and the administration should get involved in. But they're using antitrust law to go after this. Is that is this the right tool? And if so, what are the implications for, as, as Ashley points out, right? These aren't just antitrust laws that apply to one industry or one company, right? These are changes that are now being sought to be made across our, our antitrust laws, as Mike points out, they've been around since the 30s, right? Are we should we be worried that we're using the wrong tool to go after what may or may not be a legitimate problem? So, so let me start with the punchline, which is I think weaponizing the antitrust laws to reach sort of non-antitrust political ends is going to bite everybody, and especially conservatives in the behind for a long time, and the American economy for the for a, a long time. And so let me give a little bit of, about why, but that's sort yeah. of where I'm going. I, I and I think um, Mike's phrase for this, I I like, and it's so I think it's the antitrust amnesty thing. It's it's effective and good, and it's so good. I. I sort of don't want to take it away by with facts, but I'm going. I'm going to. Um, so, uh, but 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 it is. But it is good. It's good stuff, and I think effective. But you know, you've got a bunch of state AGs, private plaintiffs, and federal governments that think that that's wrong. I mean, they all think that they're going to win these cases. Uh, the the sort of somebody who just sort of you know, I teach antitrust law. It's what I do. That you know, the idea that you've got an 1890 statute, and oh goodness, what are we going to do with a search engine? Uh, how possibly could uh, Article Three judges interpret a law that says you have to show harm to competition? That's basically what stat what uh, what courts have held uh, in a bunch of nine nothing cases that one has to do to win an antitrust case, and people do, right? So. Um, the big paradigmatic case that all that these plaintiffs are, are citing to is the DOJ's case against Microsoft for a tech, biggest technology product of the time um, that, by the way, they won in front of a pretty conservative DC circuit handily. Uh, a guy a couple doors down from me, Judge uh, uh, Doug Ginsburg, uh, uh, was, was on that panel and they won handily uh, and, and, and changed the law. I, I sat on the commission for a a long time. I can't think of a time period in which at least one, two, or three of the tech companies we're mostly discussing weren't under order by one agency or another for sort of some, something where uh, they consented under a, a competition investigation. All the time, plaintiffs are going out and bringing cases, and you know, you win some, you lose some. I think a key to keep our sort of eyes on here is a couple of things. One, the United States antitrust laws have a couple of, I think, what I view as signature features that sort of stand out about the American antitrust approach as opposed to uh, Europe or China in particular. Yeah. One is they are flexible over time. The consumer welfare standard, this sort of idea that what you need to do as the plaintiff, your burden of proof is show harm to competition. Show it in a zero price market, show it in a high tech market, show it in a low tech market, show it across industries. And we have lots of fights over what that means. And not everybody likes the way all the cases come out, but plaintiffs can win antitrust cases, governments can win antitrust cases, private plaintiffs can win antitrust cases. Um, the flexibility is, I think, a signature as opposed to a really, Mike started with this is law enforcement, not regulation. The alternative is this really sort of top down. I come out with a list of rules. And if you violate them, you're under order with the European government for 20 years. Flexibility right. is key. Judicial review is key. We do more judicial. We have a more judge centric antitrust system in the United States than anywhere else in the world. And I think that has served us very well over time. And I think for conservatives, the idea that we would rather have a regulatory board of the, the Biden FTC rather than Article Three judges, including a lot of recent Trump judges, uh, deciding these cases and deciding whether the evidence is sufficient in any individual case, uh, I'll put my money on the latter. And the last, I think, sort of key feature of the US antitrust system, as opposed to Europe or China, is that what we do in law enforcement is we target anti-competitive behavior, we don't punish success. There's a great quote, from Justice Scalia in the Trinko opinion that's uh, tell my students sort of reads like a love poem to monopoly pricing. It says, if you, if you competed to get it, 
right? As opposed to burn down the rival's factory or do, do something right. that competitive. If you compete to win, we don't make you put your hands behind your back to keep fighting. That's not uh, consistent with the way we think about competition. Right. Uh, th there, there are rules for those firms uh, and we enforce the law uh, even handedly, but we do not turn on companies that are successful. And I think that's one of the reasons why you have a lot of successful companies here uh, that innovate and contribute to our economic growth. I, look, Mike started with, with things about the politics of those companies, uh, particular companies. He doesn't like There's things about their politics. I don't, I don't like much either. Uh, my view is uh, it is fairly short-sighted, uh, whatever and however strong one's view are about using the antitrust laws, which are an attractive weapon. I get why people want to do it. There's big remedies and you can shout, break them up and the statute will let you do it, right? There's attractive yeah. things about the remedies available. I, I get it. It's a big, shiny tool um, that can do a lot of damage. Um, but my view is uh, tearing apart any of those sort of signature features of U.S. antitrust law to do it is short-sighted because it will backfire on the economy as a whole in the long run, yeah. but in the immediate run, saying that we think it is uh, both okay and attractive and desirable even to use the U.S. antitrust laws to achieve, to achieve short-run political ends while it's Lena Khan's FTC blows my mind a little bit, to be honest. Yeah. It, yeah. it gets reported often that you know Lena got bipartisan support. She also had more no votes than any commissioner in history. Um, yeah. So, you know, I think I was the most controversial commissioner from the right, and I had a- Not anymore, team. yeah. Right, I not mean, anymore. you know, I'm not the youngest anymore either, which is the yeah. thing I'm really sad about. But um, look, what she is Or said, the prettiest, to be clear, or the or the most attractive, to be clear. Right? I, have, I mean, I hold, I hold no You got good no hair, record. you got good hair. <laughs> so, but I think she's made clear. I mean, if anybody is not listening to what they say they want to do with the powers that will be vested to them, uh, with the various sort of forms of proposed legislation. They were going to convert the agency from law enforcement to regulation. We yeah. know that because she told us. They're yeah. going to devalue American SEP rights, which largely is a big wealth transfer to China. We know this because they told us. And they're going to use, speaking of weaponizing the antitrust laws for political ends, they've got different political ends than Mike or me, or probably anybody else on, on the panel. What they would like to do is do a lot of social justice sort of goals and objectives through places in the FTC Act and the antitrust laws where yeah. they think they can do it. Yeah, I think that that's bad. I think that will be bad today. Uh, I think the long-term negative consequences, both for economic growth and national security are more serious and larger. Um, but sort of even on the short run, run, run politics, and it's sort of, you know, it's, it's, it's outside yeah. of my immediate lane, uh, but those are my views. Yeah, so I'm gonna, actually, I'm gonna come back to you on this antitrust question before we go to the audience for questions. And by the way, uh, for the audience members, in about five minutes or so, we're gonna come to you for questions. So please put your questions in the Q&A section um, and, we'll, uh, and we'll ask some of those uh, here in just a minute. Uh, but Mike, how about, how about that? How about, I mean, I saw you sort of grinning as Josh making his points. I mean. This sounds, I mean, what Josh is saying, it seems right to me. I mean, this idea somehow that, you know, we're going to use the antitrust laws to effectuate, you know, these political ends that you've laid out. I mean, look, there are, there are political concerns, to be sure, but it doesn't seem like, you know, the right way to do this. Help us understand why you think that this is the right approach uh, for people to take when it comes to, uh, uh, you know, uh, our, our approach to antitrust. And, and glad I'm going to bring you in on the mass shooter question here in just a second, but, but Mike, Back this up. I don't. I don't get how we think it makes sense to use the antitrust laws, particularly given what Josh said about you know the the things that other people want to get done in the antitrust laws. Aren't aren't you aren't you doing a deal with the devil here? I didn't say that we should use the antitrust laws for political purposes. I said that that's the, the reality is is that's why conservatives are are upset with big tech. And okay, the, but but a reality the, you're helping but, shape, but, right? I mean, reality you're helping shape, right? But the, the, the uh, here's, here's the problem with big tech. Um, big tech uh, has, uh, you know, big tech has done a very good job of cornering the DC market. They, uh, they give a lot of money to lawmakers in Washington, particularly Google. They give a lot of money to the outside interest groups in Washington. Um, and uh, there are a lot of conservatives in Washington, politicians, policymakers, law professors, many others, who are bought off by Google, right? And so they've done a very good job of, uh, of keeping the right uh, bought off 
satiated uh, in, in Washington, D.C. I think what Google did not expect was this populist uprising, this, this, this uh, conservative populist uprising uh, from the right. That's, that's, really, uh, that's really blindsided them from the right. And you can thank Internet Accountability Project for, for part of that. But I that's don't think they expect that that's my organization. I don't think they expect it. Generally, they, they expect that they would be able to fend off the Elizabeth Warren types, right? They're just a bunch of crazy liberals and, you know, we, we can deal with them. We have conservatives, we have Republicans in line. Uh, I don't think they expect it to lose their right flank. And uh, that's the problem that's happening here. And I, I would say this, uh, let's look at the antitrust laws, right? We have these yeah. antitrust laws that have been in the books for a century, Sherman Act, Clayton Act. Um, they're, they're pretty broad and they're pretty clear. Um, and they've been have, effective and have been effective at, at staving off monopoly, right? They've been very effective. And we have to think about, we don't want monopolies in America. It's, this, it's the right. closest you're going to get to socialism is having monopolies in America. We do not want woke corporations running our country, right? We do not want any corporations running our country. We don't want Standard Oil 100 years ago. We don't want monopolies. They are anti-American. The antitrust laws are are very pro-America laws. They protect the yeah. free market. In order to have a free market, you must have a functioning market, right? And if you don't, if you have monopolists using their power to harm competition, to harm the free market, you, you don't have a free market anymore. So that's yeah. the point of the enforcing our antitrust laws is so you have a free market, right? Well, but and big tech is yeah. abusing their market power. They, they are harming That's the all market. Yeah. They are harming competition. Yeah. And let me give you this example again. Right. People said all along, if you don't like Twitter, build your own Twitter. Okay, so what did Parler do? Parler came along and built their own Twitter, essentially mm -hmm. a competitor to Twitter. So what happens? You had big tech monopolists blaming Parler for the January 6th riots at the Capitol, even though they're largely organized on Facebook. And so you had Google and Apple the app store duopoly collude to kick Parler out of the app stores. And then you had Amazon kick them off the internet, right? And what's the recourse, right? You would think that's a clear anti-competitive antitrust violation. Like, what, but, but what's the problem? You have, you have what's called the consumer welfare standard, which is what conservative academics like Josh Wright uh, supports. Uh, you know, they, they are, you know, it was, it's uh, the late great Justice Scalia Judge Bork, this is, I mean, this is a great policy idea about the consumer welfare. Your system. heroes, to be fair on everything else, right? My, yeah, exactly. and, I think, and frankly, I, I, I largely agree with the consumer welfare standard. I think it's a great idea. And I, you know, here's the problem. It's not yeah. in the legislation, right? It is conservative judicial activism. It is wow. made up by conservative academics, conservative judges to rewrite our century-old antitrust laws to make it harder to bring antitrust lawsuits. And the problem is, is that, you look at these these social media platforms, you look at Facebook, you look at Twitter, you look at Google search, Google Maps, Gmail. The problem is, is they are allegedly free, right? And so how does the consumer welfare standard apply to these free apps, right? But they're not free. These are not trillion dollar monopolists by giving out freebies. They collect, these big tech monopolists collect as much data as they can on each of us and they sell us. We are the commodity. They sell us to advertisers. Well, they, their money. We know that, right? I mean, we know that, right? Americans know that that when you get these free products, something is free, right? It's not nobody's confused about this, right? So this is a, this is an interesting point, though. So Ashley, uh, before we go to the audience, I do wanna I do wanna bring you and Glenn in real quick before we go to the audience. The audience, we will be to you in just a minute here. Um, Ashley, like you know, Josh makes a really important point, I think, uh, and, and and I'm not sure I, I'm not sure if I heard Mike respond to it, but um, but I, what I want to know, and Mike, maybe in the in the in the in the in the, in the audience questions, we can get to this, but you know. Should we really be um, using these tools, right, that have been historically pretty effective uh, at, 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 at pushing out competition to address things that don't appear to be competitive in nature, right? Josh's point is bigness isn't a problem normally in the American economy. It's about how you get there. It's if you use that power uh, in a way that's problematic, right? Are we seeing aspects that Mike made a couple points that there are some examples maybe of, 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 of size and power, market power being utilized in ways that might be problematic. Is that a problem that we're seeing in a large way in the way that, that antitrust laws were designed to prevent in your mind, well, Ashley? 
Well, I mean, this this is just a pro, uh, you know a classic you know status versus action you know problem that's you know apparent in other laws. It's not you know the status of the you know firm being large or being whatever else it is. It's what they do to become large, what they right. do to maintain those um, powers. I'd like to address the judicial activism um, point, though. I work for this yeah. organization called the Committee for Justice. We've um, combated um, judicial activism for the past twenty years, so you can thank us for that. Um, and really, what so going back to 1890 to about 1915, you know, contract and restraint of trade, that meant pretty much anything. And there's a huge difference between judicial activism and um, statutory interpretation, statutory construction. The laws were written that way. Um, actually, yeah. Amy Coney Barrett um, described it pretty brilliantly in her confirmation hearing when asked by Amy Klobuchar about, you know, what does the Sherman Act mean and how is it meant to be interpreted? And if anything, the consumer welfare standard is a safe guardrail against judicial activism. Um, it puts up a boundary so that we don't have you know, antitrust for the means of enforcing, you know, environmental laws or like product liability laws or this, any of these, you know, huge grab bag of liberals ideas. So it couldn't be further from the opposite of that. Yeah, interesting. So Glenn, uh, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the audience on questions after you, but I want to bring you on this question of, of, of national security, right? So we've heard a lot. I mean, you heard the debate between Ashley and Josh and Mike about antitrust and politics and the like, but you made an important point, which is we are in a global competition with China, right? And the reality is that these companies like them not big big or not politically problematic or not right they are the most innovative portion of our economy right they are where and they're the future of the american economy whether it's big tech or small tech or medium tech right tech is technology and the, and the innovation that it brings is the heart of the american economy we're we're not going to be manufacturing you know big steel forever we're not going to be you know we're, we're just it's not the reality of our situation so glenn how do we think about all of this, this huge fight over politics and technology and, and antitrust in the context of this large scale competition with China and our ultimate national security, which is, you know, China's looking across the Taiwan Straits at Taiwan. China's looking at the South China Sea. They're looking at our allies in India, in Japan and Australia and saying, hey, this is our area. You better watch out. How should we think about this? You hit the nail exactly right on the head. Um, there's no question that um, we need to take into account national security concerns when looking at uh, the application of either the existing antitrust laws through lawsuits or some of the legislation that's coming out of the House Judiciary Committee, um, which, which would uh, impinge upon the activities of, of big tech. No one's suggesting that we coddle them, that they be immunized, that there aren't business practices that should be uh, perhaps looked at. My point would be, Let's target those business practices that we find nefarious and, and, and harmful to our economy and address them specifically rather than using, if you will, the sledgehammer, so to speak. Uh, Josh alluded to the, 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 the major remedies available under, anti, uh, under antitrust laws. It doesn't mean we, we should, shouldn't use them, but let's do so with a clear understanding, which, by the way, I might add, going back to the FTC Qualcomm case, it's very clear that it's acceptable to take into account national security factors. And the reason it's important is we can't afford to get it wrong. If we're using antitrust laws, in some case to go after a soap manufacturer that's too big, for example, well, the consequences if we get it wrong is that maybe there'll be a, some market dislocation or adjustment that needs to be made later on. If we make a mistake here in terms of antitrust, and have the effect of uh, impinging our ability, hurting our ability of these major companies that are assisting the United States economy with tremendous innovation in the areas of quantum technology, artificial intelligence, et cetera, and allow China to get ahead of where it would otherwise be if we hadn't had this activity, then we're gonna be making a strategic mistake. We're not gonna be able to fix it easily. Yeah. So, so we need to make sure that if we're treading in this area, and again, I'm not saying we shouldn't, I'm just simply saying, yeah. let's do so with a very clear eyed view of the effect on national security. And if we have questions, some opportunities, I'll point out one or two areas in the national security, which just from my own personal background at the National Security Agency, I saw the role that these yeah. the big tech companies play in, in furtherance of our national security. Yeah, so that's a, that's a really important point, Glenn. So Harold Moss, one, I did say I would take questions of the audience. So Harold Moss, one of our visiting fellows here at NSI, uh, and a long time uh, leader in the technology space um, asks, you know, points out that Russia and China are both actively focused on constraining communication models uh, uh, by companies like Apple, Google, and Twitter. Uh, why would it benefit Americans to introduce, introduce these type of policies, as he describes communistic policies, to our technology sector, right? And he asked whether, uh, whether our panel has considered the inevitable impacts of applying these new constraints on the tech sector 
as you know, it is a degrading innovation, which also benefits um, our competition against our national adversaries. So I'll, I'll, I'll say that to you, Mike. You know, you made the point about how some of these companies behave when it comes to American national security and and and, and Chinese national security. What about the idea that Harold raises that you know, if we apply these, these constraints on the tech sector, we're just going to tank the most innovative sector of our economy? So the whole point of American antitrust law is to make sure that we don't have monopolists that kill competition because competition breeds innovation. Okay. I, I thought that was a baseline understanding of our antitrust law that competition right. breeds innovation. So I guess I'm having a hard time understanding uh, how enforcing our antitrust laws against Google, for example, would 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 harm our national security. I mean, we I just explained how Google is a trillion dollar monopolist, and they had this Project Maven, this drone program with yeah. the federal government, and they re, they refused to renew their contract because of their activist employees who didn't like the drone program. Okay, well, Google is a monopolist. There, are, there were not yeah. other companies who could easily step up and resume that drone program. So you had the U.S. government scrambling to do that because there was not competition, right? Well, these yeah. monopolies, these monopolies harm innovation. They don't help innovation in this country. It's, it's the exact opposite of what you, uh, what's being argued here. It's that if we, we need to enforce our century-old antitrust laws, update them if we need to, to, to apply to big tech because we need to foster innovation. We So we want to well, become but, but more like, about that, we, we want our national security to become we want our anti we because we we want to com, we want to become like china so yeah. we can compete with like with china i mean is an american innovation i mean Amer we're not stealing chinese technology they're stealing ours right it's yeah. because we're well, we're but, the innovative country right I mean, isn't that the point mike we've 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 been just so innovative i mean these these companies that you're describing right i mean they're they're extremely innovative companies it's not like we're it's like we're not seeing innovation right we're seeing innovation Right, and I mean, Josh's point earlier is one that I, I, I want to sort of under, I want to sort of ask you about because I don't really understand it, uh, understand your response, which is, if these companies were user monopoly power in a way that was suppressing small companies and competition, but we have a robust startup sector in this country. I mean, it's the we're we there 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 is a huge it's the it's by far the most robust startup sector in the world. What what is the what is the antitrust activity that you're talking about where these companies are using monopoly power to suppress competition because i don't i haven't heard so you do we, do we so it's when when we have a startup community and that's separate from big tech monopolists right they're not all the same and we, we can't lump them all together and say oh look at all this innovation out of american technology country uh, companies and then say you know this is why we need to continue to give antitrust amnesty to google for example because we can't harm that innovation right yeah. that's nonsense like that Monopolists are bad for innovation. Monopolists harm competition. They acquire companies. They harm innovation. I mean, I thought, you know, I, I, up until now, when when the you know the antitrust sort of Damocles is hanging over uh, big tech monopolist head, I, I thought that was the yeah. baseline understanding that innovation is good and and competition creates innovation. But yeah. you know, now we're trying to say that. We can't enforce our antitrust laws, or we have to be cautious about enforcing our antitrust laws because, you know, we're we're going to hurt yeah. Google, and that harms innovation, and therefore we're yeah. we're going to be weaker when it comes to China. This is all nonsense. So, so, I so, mean, Ashley, so, so, so Mark, if I, if I, yeah. if I can, for yeah, Josh, a second. please, yeah, hop in, yeah, sure. I mean, there's five thousand and twenty lawsuits active right now. I mean. People are going to go to a federal court, they're going to go to Article Three judges, and they're going to make specific claims that those companies are harming competition and using their monopoly power in a good in a in a, in a bad way. Right. And judges will see evidence. And like they have for the history of the consumer welfare standard, plaintiffs will win or lo lose those cases based on the quality of their cases, with yeah. a large fraction of them brought in front of, of conservative Trump judges that Mike and both like. Right. Yeah. They're going to go bring those cases and adjudicate them in front of judges and they will rise or fall on the quality of 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 the as evidence as it should be, um, you know, in in my view. And, and, I, and I think, Mike, and to be to be fair, I, I think the idea where you say the, the sort of basic understanding of the antitrust laws is to stop monopoly. I do think that's wrong. And I'm not trying to be sort of acute or clever about it. The United States antitrust laws say if I get the monopoly by out competing my rivals, if I build a better mousetrap or a better advocacy group or a better law firm, or a better lemonade stand, and I become the monopolist because I innovated and I was entrepreneurial, yeah. uh, my basic understanding of the antitrust laws 
and maybe we can we can come hang out and read my treatise together. Uh, but my understanding of the antitrust laws is that it has always been, at least in the United States, not in Europe or China, at least in the United States, that competing, becoming the monopolist because I am better, we allow. Using my monopoly power to harm competition is unlawful. And that's a line where we might disagree on individual cases or where it should be. And, and I think that's all well and good. But that, you know, those Josh, cases I agree. are being I agree with you. Good. Big is not bad. It's and I think I, I think we're there's monopoly. Except when they're meaning conservatives. But no, but the there's, there's, there's monopolies versus monopolists. You could be big. You could be a monopoly in this country. You could you can have ninety five percent market share. That's not illegal. It's when you use your market power to harm competition, and that's exactly what Google is doing. That's exactly what well, these big yeah. tech platforms are doing. So I want to I want to bring Ashley into the conversation real quick, if I could. Ashley, so one of the questions for our audience, I did say I would take audience questions. I do love this debate. And we, by the way, we're going to have more of this. We have three more sessions on this. We're going to talk about what our allies are doing, what the Europeans and other allies are doing. We're going to talk about what our, what our opponents, what our adversaries are doing, what China are doing. And then we're going to come back and talk about the home front and these and the changes of the law. So folks should tune in for our, our continuation of the series. But Ashley, Mark Williams asked about making Delray's proposal. Uh, to establish a digital markets rulemaking board. I mean, this sounds like, and again, uh, a, a Trump appointee conservative, right? Talk about a, the creation of a, of a regulatory body. Is this a good idea or what, Ashley? Um, I'm not sure which proposal he's referring to specifically, yeah. um, whether that happened, you know, after the end of the Trump administration or yeah. during it. Um, so that would be hard to say. I mean, in, in general, I, I don't think we need an additional regulatory body. I'm yeah. <laughs> more broadly against the creation of any other additional industry, but I, I think that we're completely capable of handling that in-house and either the DOJ and that, or the FTC. And I think that we need to clean up problems of overlapping agency jurisdiction too, before yeah. even looking at that sort of proposal. It's an important point. Uh, so I'm going to end on you, Glenn, uh, with a question for the audience, which is uh, what, you know, we talked, you started talking about national security implications and the like. Um, and one of the questions is, is if we start going after these big tech companies using the antitrust laws to break them up, um, is that going to harm their ability to invest in the kind of R&D we need at the scale we need to compete against China? And if so, how do we think about that in the context of these conversations? Absolutely. I think that's one of the big fears uh, that, that uh, if, if it, it were possible to use the antitrust laws to break up these companies and tell Amazon or Google or Microsoft, you're too big and you need to split up into five different companies, separate lines of business, um, that is going to have uh, effects in a couple of ways. Number one, it's certainly going to uh, have a negative effect on their ability to undertake the kind of massive R&D expenditures that we need to keep uh, America at the forefront of the technological revolution. And of course, I'm referring principally to artificial intelligence, which is going to be the defining technology for the next few decades, possibly the advent of quantum computing, which both the United States and, and China are racing to, to develop, along with a wide range of other, of other, um, of other technologies. Uh, the, the federal government is no longer the, driving the R&D expenditure in this nation. It's the five or six big tech companies. And, and again, yeah. just basically hurting them is going to have an effect. The second area where it's going to have an effect is China is, is pushing its companies to compete with American technology companies across the globe. They're particularly looking at moving into Europe and into Latin America. They're, they're not particularly interested in going head to head with the American behemoths. Understand right. that's tough. But where there are gaps or weaknesses, they will move in to exploit that. We're certainly seeing that in Europe and in Latin America. And to the extent that we uh, uh, undercut the ability of American companies to, effe to, to compete effectively across the globe, we're going to be uh, giving China uh, an opportunity to, to take advantage of that. And, and I, again, I'm not suggesting that all is perfect and we can't change anything, but we absolutely, we can't afford to get this right. We've got to take national security concerns into account. Yeah. Well, that's a great point, Glenn, and a great point to end on. Thank you, uh, Glenn, Mike, Josh, Ashley, for being here with us today. What a great conversation. Thanks to the audience for being here. I said we'd end on time. It's one o'clock. Uh, we'll be hosting our second panel, as I mentioned, on the national security implications of antitrust, what our allies are doing um, on September 23rd. So tune in for that. Also tune in to NATSEC Nightcap with Bill Browder, uh, the man who really created the Magnitsky legislation on, on September 2nd. Also follow us on LinkedIn, on Twitter, at Mason NATSEC. And check out our podcast, Fault Lines, Iron Butterfly, and NSI Live. Thank you all. Have a great afternoon. And thanks again to our panel for being here. See you all soon. Thanks, Jeffrey. Thank you.